the fifth kind. Please check out and subscribe to our all new featured clips YouTube channel, Fifth Kind Clips. Follow the links in the description. Check out our official website at fifthkind.tv. There's no doubt that translating Elohim in the plural reframes the whole story of human beginnings. Why is the translation of the word Elohim so controversial? Why through so many centuries has it been translated as God? When Elohim is translated in the plural, what is the startling truth that emerges hidden in plain sight in the pages of Genesis? When Elohim is translated in the plural, it reveals plural beings, plural interventions in our evolution as a species, and plural agendas for the human race. The plural Elohim, the powerful ones, were part of the world of Abraham and Sarah, the progenitors of the Hebrew tradition. When a neighboring chief asked Abraham, why did you leave Ur of the Chaldees, which was a Mesopotamian-based culture full of stories of sky people, the answer that Abraham gave was, because the Elohim, plural noun, told me, plural verb. These plural beings were part of Abraham and Sarah's world, and they crop up later in their story. Though generations of translators have translated Elohim as God, Abraham, the progenitor of the Hebrew tradition, was very familiar with Elohim as plural beings. The word means, if we take the root meaning, it means the powerful ones. Now, some scholars have argued that it means the powers of God, and that's why it's in the plural. But that doesn't quite relate to how other pluralizations work in Hebrew. A kurub is a cherub. Kurubim is many cherubs, not the many qualities of cherub kind. When translators want to say that it means the powers of God, what that fails to take into account is that these powers conflict with one another over agendas for the human race. These powers go to war against each other, and human beings get genocided in the process of those conflicts. So, no, it's not the powers of a divinity. We are talking about ET demographics who arrived as a colonizing force on planet Earth, and our ancestors were caught in the crossfires as they went to war over Project Earth. The ancient Norse mythologies speak of conflicts among advanced beings as they conflict with one another over the management of the human race. These stories can be found to echo all around the world. The ancient Indian Vedas and the stories of the Mahabharata tell of kings warring against each other with advanced technology as they battle for hegemony over Project Earth. Greek mythology speaks of advanced beings living nearby but somehow inaccessible to the human race on Mount Olympus. They too battle with one another over questions of how to manage human beings. These stories of wars among the powerful ones are there in Genesis as well. There is a whole theme of stories in the pages of the Hebrew Scriptures which can be referred to as the Sky Council, sometimes referenced as the Divine Council or the Heavenly Council. But the behavior of the members of the Council, not that divine, not that heavenly, they really do go to war with one another and conflict with one another constantly over questions of how the human race should be developed and herded, protected, or otherwise. So these council members, they're not avatars for a loving, holy God. 
They are different ET factions competing with one another for stakes in the management of our planet. In Escaping from Eden and the Scars of Eden, I argue that the Elohim reference the members of this ancient Sky Council, which our ancestors were aware of. In 1 Kings 22, one of the Hebrew prophets was able to remote view what was going on in that council, and it wasn't pretty. If you go back to the stories of beginnings in Genesis 1 to 11, we have stories that reveal a number of ET arrivals, incursions, interventions, and a number of different agendas bumping up against each other. So the first agenda we find in Genesis 1, the first two sentences, and it seems to be a benevolent one because there what's being recalled is the arrival of ET visitors who are helping to recover planet Earth after a cataclysm that has left the planet devastated and for the most part flooded. And so it's a benevolent intervention to rehabilitate life on Earth. And that's a story that you can find echoed in ancestral narratives and mythologies in cultures spanning the globe. And the details that correlate are very, very interesting. If we come to Genesis 3, here we have two agendas for humanity conflicting with one another. One is saying, let's upgrade the human beings to be more like us. And another is saying, we don't want them too much like us. One faction wants the humans more conscious, more intelligent for a better human experience. And the other faction wants the humans kept so unintelligent that we don't even know we're naked, wants us at an animal level. And there's a conflict and it's actually the subordinate who goes ahead and does the genetic modification and does the upgrade. Now, all those themes can be found in the Sumerian stories. And what happens the moment you translate Elohim in the plural is, of course, you realize we're reading the Sumerian stories. We're reading the stories of Enlil and Enki and the other sky people of the Mesopotamian narratives. In Genesis 6, there is a story told which echoes in cultures all around the world. You can find it in Africa, the Caribbean, the Philippines, India, in Nordic countries, in Celtic regions, Scotland, Wales and Ireland all have versions of this story. And it's a story of ancient hybridization. What's interesting the way Genesis 6 reports that is that it is the second wave of ET arrivals that our ancestors appear to remember. And these ones, the Bene Elohim, the ones like the powerful ones, the second wave of powerful ones, they're here for another reason. They find the human race very attractive and want to be more like us. And so they take human females in order to improve their own gene pool. It's such a bizarre story. It comes from the blue. The writer of Genesis 6 assumes we all know the story from somewhere else. And indeed, you can go anywhere on the planet to hear ancestral versions of that story. The flood in Genesis 6 is another narrative that repeats around the world. And it comes in response to this hybridization that has upset the delicate balance among ET demographics involved in what's going on in planet Earth. They argue about how many humans there should be on the planet, how long lived they should be, and then there's this genocide that's perpetrated. Genesis 11, there is a visitation of planet Earth by another extraterrestrial force. The way it's translated right now, it's presented as a Yahweh story. That's the holy name of God given to Moses. But this is a story from ages before the time of Moses. And there are clues that we're reading an Elohim story because the pluralizations are still there. These beings come and are so horrified to find a technological human race that they bomb our ancestors into a Stone Age condition where all the technology is lost and our ancestors even had to re-evolve 
the power of speech. This is a very profound neurological interference upon our ancestors that is absolutely horrific. The current translation says it's Yahweh who did it. Dig a little deeper and you realize these were the actions of the Elohim. What were these ancient ET presences doing on planet Earth? What were the motivations behind their presence? And what were the agendas that brought them into conflict? You see, if you fail to realize we're talking about a council or a federation that is debating and arguing and going to war, if you translate all that as the actions of God, because Elohim equals God, then all of a sudden you have a God who's double-minded, argues with himself, goes to war against himself so violently that the human race almost gets wiped out in the process. You think about the conflicts over how intelligent human beings should be. The flood story where one demographic wants to kill them all and one wants to save humanity. These are conflicting agendas. They are not the conflicting thoughts of a deity. They are the stories of ancient conflicts that our ancestors have recalled in different ways, using different images and different metaphors, but making it very clear the same memory is being evoked. And it's the story of an alien presence on planet Earth. In 2020, Haim Ashed, the former chief of Israel's space security agency, gave a briefing in which he referred to an intergalactic federation. In effect, a council of ET presences, all with a stakeholding in planet Earth, but who wish their presence to be kept a secret. Haim Ashed is only the latest of a number of senior officials in 2020 who have made such comments. Chris Mellon, the former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Presidents Clinton and George W. Bush, along with Eric Davis, the physicist, have given briefings regarding ET technology. Materials from off-world vehicles not made on this Earth. That is another acknowledgement of an ET presence around planet Earth, a council of ET demographics. And this is very much in tune with what we heard through the decades from Ed Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon. He, from the 1970s until his death in 2016, was a constant advocate for the USA declassifying its UFO files so that the human race could take its place as part of a community of space faring species. And that was his hope for humanity in the light of all that he had discovered. Now, bearing in mind that Ed Mitchell and all involved in the Mercury and Apollo programs would have been bound by layers and layers of official secrets laws, the fact that he said that publicly so many times, I find very significant. Now that we're hearing from Alain Juillet, the former head of French intelligence, from Eric Davis, from Chris Mellon, from Louis Elizondo, who headed up the Pentagon unit for investigating UFO engagement and crashes. And now that we've heard from Haim Ashed, the former chief for Israel's space security program, a picture is emerging that lines up with what our ancestors told us about the Sky Council. It's very interesting to look at what these Elohim, these powerful ones, conflicted over. So they have an argument in Genesis 3 about how intelligent the human beings should be, how educated, how informed, what access they should have to food and water, what access to medicines. These are all part of the story. And then we get to Genesis 11 and there's a story about whether human beings should be allowed this level of technology or this level of technology. How long lived should they be? How many should we have on the planet before we take action? These are all the fights that they have. What's interesting about those themes is they are very relevant to the 21st century. And anyone reading these stories might ask, are these stories about our past 
or about our present. Because even today, people will debate, human population, do we have a problem? What is the best or the most sustainable population for planet Earth? And what action should we take if we think there are too many humans? Debates about access to food are very topical. Food and water in the 21st century. You've got the conflicts between petrochemical, GM, industrial scale farming, where foods are patented, and so access to food becomes an issue. Competing against traditional organic combination rotational farming, which has been the way we've done it through the ages and through centuries, which is more empowering at the grassroots level, if I can put it that way. Or access to medicines. Again, there's a conflict between the industrial pharmaceutical approach with a control of patents, which then limits access to life-saving medicines, or you've got the more traditional approach and the open market approach. They conflict against one another. Access to drinking water is a huge issue in the 21st century. Is it a right for human populations or is it a right for corporations? And that is a very real struggle right now. The story about human intelligence, how intelligent should human beings be, is also very topical. Just this year in Australia, we had some legislative changes that were about positioning our education system to deliver human beings who are industry ready. And so there's been a shift away from an education model to a training model, to an industry led model. And this really echoes some of the language we find in our ancient stories, the Popol Vuh in particular. The Popol Vuh expresses the Mayan narrative of beginnings. It tells of advanced beings arriving on a flooded planet Earth, who set about terraforming and adapting our ancestors into a useful workforce. Quetzalcoatl, otherwise known as Kukulkan or Kukumats, is the chief genetic engineer. He produces a being more advanced than ourselves. We could call him Homo sapiens Quetzalcoatlus, which is us plus, us plus a bit of precognition, us plus a bit of remote viewing. So cognitive abilities a bit more developed than our own. And unfortunately, Quetzalcoatl and the other powerful ones confer and they, they say, these humans are too difficult to manage. They're too smart. Can we dumb them down? And so the final experiment involves Quetzalcoatl producing a vapor that when sprayed over human populations damages their neurological connections so that their perceptual field is brought down to the five physical senses. No more remote viewing, no more precognition. They can just see and hear what's around them. Now they can be corralled and managed. Now this is another story that when you hear it, you think, wait a minute, a vapor sprayed over human populations to dumb them down. Are we talking about the past or the present? Because today people are concerned about what is being sprayed into our atmospheres. Why are we finding metals in our soils, in our oceans, in our food supply? And is that good for us? When I was a boy back in the 1970s, I remember the stories coming in as investigative journalists followed the research that was suggesting what we were pumping into our atmosphere from our road vehicles was damaging our children neurologically. Children who lived in highly polluted areas, went to school in schools that were surrounded by idling traffic, were found to be more aggressive and less intelligent because of lead in the fuel we were using. I'm very thankful for that research because it has produced a result whereby we're now driving vehicles that are hybrid vehicles that use lead-free fuel, and it's because we didn't want to brain damage our children. So this story of a vapor that creates brain damage is contemporary, it's ancient. In ancient Rome, they used water that came into their city through lead-lined pipes 
and in the 1800s, researchers began to suggest that this could have had an effect on the behavior of the ancient Romans, making them less intelligent, more aggressive, because once again, of lead poisoning. Now, even those who want to debunk that story, who, who don't think that was a significant factor, have to acknowledge that the lead level in Roman water was a hundred times the lead content of the spring waters in the districts around. So these concerns about what's being pumped into our environment, they are very relevant today, and they were relevant thousands of years ago when our ancestors wrote these stories about the vapor and Quetzalcoatl and their agenda for humanity. But what is a mythology? Is it a vehicle of ancient memory? Or is it a metaphor to convey moral teachings or philosophical ideals? When you see some of the extraordinary correlations among the ancestral narratives of cultures, ancient cultures that apparently had no contact with each other, for me, it's those overlaps that first drew my attention and made me realize I'd been reading some of these stories wrong. Some people read them in a fundamentalist way, as if every detail, every word, that's what happened, word for word. Others try and look for a moral in the story. You can't really read the Genesis stories that way. The morals that would emerge from them would be ridiculous. But as I saw the correlations, I began to realize these are carrying memory. And sometimes what's being brought to us is a visual memory. And different cultures have different language and different metaphors, different images, but they're reporting the same visual memory of what happened to our ancestors in a time long ago. And so it's very possible that these stories have been curated, not just to tell us about the past, but to give us a grid for understanding why things work the way they do today. Are our world mythologies given to evoke a picture of hope, or are they a counsel of despair? Do the ET narratives suggest humanity as a noble, sovereign species, or as a species engineered to slave for an alien presence? I actually find the idea of a counsel of ET presences somewhat reassuring, because the ancient stories tell us that among that spectrum of agendas, are some agendas that are very pro-human, that there are some demographics who are here because they care about homo sapiens, they care about human beings. Their presence on the council is a stabilizing and reassuring one. But even those who came with more selfish agendas, those who came in Genesis 6 to hybridize, point to the fact that there is something unique and special about human beings. And I wonder if, if we can do business with these ancient stories, if we can do business with what Hamish Ed is saying, that there is a galactic federation of which we can potentially be a part, we can then begin to see that the human race is something very special in the cosmos. Some are here because of us. And I wonder if we might see ourselves in a different light. Is it possible that our unique blend of animal strength mammal emotion and higher consciousness has produced a species with a unique capacity for love, compassion, creativity, and harmony. I don't find it hard to believe that there are some here because human beings are unique and special for those reasons. And if that is the case, and we can take our place in an intergalactic federation, then I wonder if we might see ourselves as a species in a different light, understanding who we are, where we came from, and our great potential as human beings. The Fifth Kind Please check out and subscribe to our all-new Featured Clips YouTube channel, Fifth Kind Clips. Follow the links in the description. Author and researcher Paul Wallace probes the world's ancient mythologies for clues about the origins of the human race. 
and has published several books in the field of mysticism and spirituality. In the last decade, his work has probed the world's ancient mythologies for the insights they hold on our origins as a species and our potential as human beings. Paul's work in church ministry has included training pastors in the interpretation of biblical texts, working as a troubleshooter for communities of faith, and serving as an archdeacon in the Anglican Church in Australia. His background as a senior churchman makes it all the more surprising that Paul's latest book argues that human origins lie in our prehistoric contact with extraterrestrial species. You can find out more information and links to Paul Wallace in the description below, along with links to his published works. Check out our official website at fifthkind.tv.